Amen. Yeah. Amen. It's wonderful to see you all back. Maybe not the whole church, but I'm pretty sure those who are thirsty for the word of God, you stayed back. Amen. So lift your hands and just say amen uh, for that. Amen. So um, I'm not going to give you any formal sermon today for this retreat. It's going to be a very informal sermon. You can write notes. Even if you want my notes, I can send it by WhatsApp to you, because I always believe that a sermon which God has given unto me is not just for me. It's for the entire church. So there are many people who actually safeguard their sermon notes like it's a treasure book, but I don't believe in that. Anybody who comes and asks for the notes, I actually give it, <laughs> give it to them. So feel free to come and ask for the notes. I can send it to you through WhatsApp, and you can also keep it as a reference, but you can also note it down. So before... Uh, I start with a meditation. Today I'm just going to keep a very interesting meditation. So it has to be interactive. Otherwise it won't be interesting. I mean, so let's close our eyes in prayer first. Thank you, Lord, for this day. Lord, let the meditation of our hearts be sweet and acceptable in your sight. Not of human wisdom, but Lord, of the wisdom that you have ordained unto us. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Okay, before I start... Uh, many people, after the service got over, they came to me and they said, yeah, I know your mom, I know your dad. <laughs> so I was actually very surprised because I came here thinking uh, people from 25 years back, they would come and recognize me. Nobody recognized me. But uh, there are people here who know my mom. They studied with my mom. And it was wonderful to see all those people over here. Um, and um, the name of our ministry is Judge Jesus Christ Comes. Now, dad was called into ministry. My dad's name is Stephen Senadibadi. He was called into ministry about 45 years back at the point of time when I was born. So he had a crippling stroke in his leg. He was a prosperous businessman. And he was uh, in every way uh, honorable in the eyes of God, going to church regularly. They... They sang in the choir because I, I don't know how many of you remember, there was a person called Dan David, an organist, uh, uh, organist called Dan David. He was one of the top organists uh, in Zion Church. We all worshipped in Zion Church. Zion Church looks very much the same, almost the same, the same architecture. I think even the pipe organ is the same. So it uh, brings me back all those old memories. But dad had the crippling stroke and the Lord Jesus Christ saved him from that and called him to ministry, you won't believe my dad still now walks without a ball and socket. For 40 years, there is a small limp, a thorn that the Lord gave him to remind him for what purpose he has been called. But I think many of you who have seen my dad, he is walking without a ball and socket for 40, 45 years now. And we, didn't, we don't allow any doctors to touch that area or recommend any treatment because it is something that the Lord has kept as a sign for us, as a warning for us, and also as a remembrance that he has called us for his ministry. But me, I didn't join ministry with my dad. I went to all the places, went with all the other people. Like I had a lot of connections with uh, my old friends like Freddie Joseph, Isaac Joe, and uh, Chadwick, and all those guys. We used to do ministry together. We used to travel to Bombay, Velour, and all those places, and I was doing ministry in uh, the Kirk as well. But at one point of time, and I was also doing well, God gave me a good education. I was a design consultant, a private design consultant for many automobile companies over here. So I had a second business, which is an interior designing business as well. So everything was set on track for me to be a prosperous human being. But since I've already given my life to the Lord when I was a youth, at one point of time, the Lord always keeps telling me, all these work that you're doing in this world are for nothing. At one point of time, any way you're going to come and do the work that I want in for you. So that was always in my mind. So none of these job uh, descriptions that I had had any sustenance over me, nor did it have any prominence over me, because at one point of time I knew the Lord was going to set me apart and bring me completely out of the world. 
and that happened exactly six months, six years ago, just one year before the COVID time. So the Lord wonderfully, graciously, He gave me a thought and He started speaking to me. He started setting, uh, setting me apart from the world and it was a slow process. The reason why Jesus did that was at any point of time, like all these, uh, what do they call it? I forgot that word for it. The father's inheritance, the children, they take it. What is it called? Huh? Uh, nepotism. <laughs> Sorry, I forgot that word. <laughs> nepotism. So at any point of time, nobody should say that I went, and because my father is in ministry, and we have a church where there are 300, 400 people who come in there, that I inherited it as a business or I inherited it as a following from my dad. So I never joined my dad. I didn't want that name to be tagged to me. And my dad used to be calling me. They used to pray for me. They even had fasting prayers in their churches to make sure that I come to their church. <laughs> but it never happened. <laughs> but at one point of time, when the Lord set me apart, he also set my paths straight as well. And that is when I realized that I will also do ministry there, and then I'll do ministry to wherever the Lord calls me. And that is exactly how I was called, because I did not come into the ministry as the son of my dad, Stephen Senadibadi, but as the son of the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, so that is something where the Lord brought us uh, both into His uh, ministry, and we've been faithful. And one thing, this is where I'm going to start my sermon, because um, when uh, pastor asked me for the topic about a, a week back, I really didn't know what I was going to speak. So when he said, uh, the judge is coming, G Christ the judge is coming, I said, okay, fine. But actually, it is going to be on the judge, but I'm going to slightly change the topic because the judge is not coming, the judge has already come. I mean, that is what we're going to do as a meditation today. I mean, so... When Jesus Christ gave us this name, Judge Jesus Christ comes, everybody heard that name and they got scared. <laughs> Serious. <laughs> because it sounds very terrorizing, isn't it? Huh? It sounds very judgmental. It sounds very condemning. And I used to have a wagoner where I used to, we used to have this name, Judge Jesus Christ comes. And the way I drove in the streets, it literally was like a judge coming to the streets itself. <laughs> Because we were crazy. We were crazy young adults at that time. So, for everyone, this name, Judge Jesus Christ, was a scary name. And one of my friends uh, who was in college, a girl, she called me about three months back. And when she called me, she actually uh, told me, oh, yeah, I've seen all your YouTube videos, they're wonderful, God's given you wonderful revelations, but why have you kept that name, Judge Jesus Christ Comes? Whenever I read the name, I get scared. Why can't you just keep Jesus saves, Jesus redeems, Jesus calls? That sounds so reassuring, so pleasant, isn't it? And that is where I wondered, yeah, maybe, judge, people are getting scared because of a ministry name. But that is where the Lord gave me an understanding and a revelation to make you know that the judge Jesus Christ comes it's not a scary name, but it is a reassuring name. Amen? And that is exactly how we're going to start this meditation today. Now, I'm going to ask you a question, and you're all going to answer, okay? We are all scared to be judged one day or the other, right? Who is not scared of the judgment? Nobody is? We are all scared, right? Just not, or at least not this way, yeah. Right? We are all scared. That's why the name is scary, Judge Jesus Christ Comes, because it's going to bring unto us judgment. Now, no human being, no Christian in this world likes to be pointed the wrong in them, isn't it? At the moment you say, oh brother, there's something wrong that you're doing, at once you'll hear statements like, who are you to judge me? First go and take the plank out of your eye and then come and judge me, huh? because nobody likes to be pointed out their wrongs. But everybody likes to be pointed out the corrects only. Isn't it? So, I want to just make a rosy point for uh, pastors like me and Devaputra and uh, uncle. I used to call him uncle, I remember. Not pastor. That's why I couldn't call you pastor Devaputra at all. 
I used to call him Deva Putra and Uncle. I've forgotten it now. <laughs> yeah, this is natural for me. Huh? Yeah. So, when pastors, when they try to point out your mistakes, it is not called judgment. It is called correction. It is called edification. Remember that. Okay, at any point of time, when your pastor tries to correct you, do not at once, when you get into your car or go to your home, oh, that pastor, he's so judgmental on us. No, he didn't try to judge you. He tried to correct you. He tried to edify you. So remember that. There's a big difference in that. Now, many people believe that judgment is reserved for the last day. So why are we going around and judging people right now? Why do we need to do that? Because 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10 says, For we must, yeah, you can read it there. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Meaning, there is going to be a judgment seat of Christ. There's going to be a judgment day. And each one will be judged according to the good or bad that they have done in this world. Now, nobody can escape this, right? Isn't it? Nobody can escape this. Can you escape this judgment? No, you cannot. Now, this is a very scary scene, right? This is a very scary scene, right? Because on that day, you don't know where the judgment is going to be balanced. Whether you're going to go to the depths of Hades or you're going to be called into the kingdom of God. But this is where... I want to assure you, dear brothers and sisters, listen to this carefully. This judgment day is not scary at all, provided we remain righteous and allow ourselves to be judged by Jesus Christ when we are living in this world, rather than not allowing ourselves to be judged in this world by Jesus Christ, and willfully remain wicked, thereby only being judged when you appear before the judgment seat of Christ. What am I telling you is, if you allow God to judge you continually as you live in this world, you need not be scared of the day of judgment because you will already be judged when you are living. Now this is where we are going to study and we are going to understand where the proof comes from, the Bible. Okay? So, firstly you have to understand why everybody thinks the word judges carry. Because when we look at the earthly judges, they pronounce judgment. But here, in the Bible, the word judge is not meant to scare anyone. Rather, it is a reassuring word. And for that, I want to ask you a question. Firstly, why do you think the Lord Jesus Christ chose the role of a judge? Why did he choose the role of a judge? Is it to condemn you? Is it to judge you on the last day? Or is it for anything else? But this is where our eyes must be opened. Now, these are all things that must reassure you and make you remove the fear factor from the word judge. Okay? So, Isaiah chapter 33 and verse 22, you can read there, For the Lord is our judge. For the Lord God Yahweh is a judge. The Lord is our lawgiver. He's the one who gave the law and the precepts to the Israelites. And then it says, the Lord is our king. Why the Lord is our king? Because in those days, they did not have supreme courts or high courts. Who's going to judge you? The king of the land has to judge you. That is why the Lord is our king. And then the last part of the verse is where you need to understand. It says, the Lord is going to destroy you. Does it say that? The Lord is going to condemn you. Does it say that? No. No. Why is the Lord a judge? Why is the Lord a lawgiver? Why is the Lord going to be our king? It is because this judge is not here to condemn you, but rather he is here to save you. Isn't that reassuring now? This judge is not to condemn you, but this judge 
is here to save you. That is where Paul is explaining in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 31 to 32. Now you have to read carefully this verse. Now this is where I told you at the start, I gave you a statement. If we do not allow ourselves to be judged in this world, then we have to go and stand on the day of judgment. But if we allow God to continuously judge us each and every day for our deeds, then we, do not be, we need not be scared about the last day of judgment. That is exactly what Paul is saying. Look at this. For if we will judge ourselves, this is talking about how we can judge ourselves by our mind. I am perfect. I don't have anything wrong in me. I don't do anything wrong. I haven't done anything wrong to anybody at all. So what are you doing? You're not allowing God to judge you. But if you are going to judge yourselves, then we will not be judged when we are living in this world. That is the meaning of this word. If you are going to judge yourself and you are going to give rosy testimonies about yourself, then you are not allowing God to judge you when you are living in this world. That is exactly what he is saying. And then in verse 32 he is saying, but when you allow yourselves to be judged by the Lord, but when we are judged by the Lord, we are chastened by the Lord, meaning we are corrected by the Lord. We are edified by the Lord. Where? Not on the day of judgment. Each and every moment in our life, each and every time we commit an error or a sin, we are edified in the Lord continuously. We are chastened by the Lord so that we may not be condemned in the world on the last day of judgment. Do you understand this? So if you do not want to be condemned on the last day of judgment, you should continuously surrender yourself and allow God to judge you each and every day in your life. Because every day we commit sins. Every day we do mistakes in our life. So who's going to save us from those mistakes? Who's going to redeem us? It is Jesus Christ. But how can we allow Him to redeem us and save us? He has to chasten us first. He has to correct us first. We have to allow to that cha chastenment because that is exactly the purpose Jesus came into this world. If you allow to do that, then you will be judged continuously in the world. You need not be scared on the last day of the judgment of the Lord. Amen. That is where in John 3.17, John is very clearly saying after the beautiful uh, 3.16, he's saying, God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world. Jesus did not come into this world to condemn you, to say, hey, you're wrong. You've done a mistake. That's it. Out of my presence. I'm done with you. No. He did not come to condemn the world, but that through Him, the world should be saved. He's a judge. He's a lawgiver. But what is his role? Not to condemn you, but he's going to save you. Amen. And that is why to the last church of Laodicea, in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 19, to the church of Laodicea, Jesus Christ is saying, as many as I love, dear members of the church, brothers and sisters, I love you. I'm not here to condemn you. I love you. So what do I do? I'm not going to hug you. I'm not going to say rosy things to you. I'm not going to make you feel good. But rather, I'm going to rebuke you and I'm going to chasten you. Meaning, you're going to be judged continuously as you live in this world. I'm going to rebuke you. I'm going to chasten you. Therefore, be zealous and repent right here in this world so that you will not be scared of the day of judgment. Amen. So the word judge is not a scary word at all. It is actually the hope for you. The word judge is actually the hope for you that through the judgment of God, through the chastisement of the Lord, you will continuously be saved. That you will not be condemned. It only remains scary. See, this is where it differs. For the righteous people who have allowed God to judge you in your lives, it is not a scary word, but it will remain scary to whom? 
to those who do not allow themselves to be judged by the Lord, but to rather judge themselves. For those people, on the day of judgment, it's going to be a scary day. Amen. So which side are you on? The scary side or on the reassuring side? Huh? We need to be on the reassuring side, isn't it? Amen. So this, for this, for everything, there is a precursor in the Bible. And for this, the prime example given unto us is David, because David was a man after God's own heart. Isn't it? So, here you see how we're going to see an example. There are many examples in the book of Psalms, how David continuously allowed himself to be judged by the Lord as he was living in this world. But I'm going to pull out an example from Psalm 26, verses 1 to 6. And here, look at how David starts this uh, uh, psalm. Vindicate me, O Lord. You know what is the meaning of the word vindicate? Judge me, prove me, and save me. Judge me, prove me, and save me. Vindicate me, O Lord, for I walked in my integrity. He's asking the Lord to judge his integrity. I've also trusted in the Lord. I shall not slip. And then the second verse, he's saying, examine me, O Lord. He's asking the Lord to judge him. Where? Not on the day of judgment. As he walks in the world each and every day. Examine me, O Lord. Prove me. Try my mind and my heart. For your loving kindness is before my eyes. Now look at this. Now David is he's assuming as if he's standing in a witness box. He's standing in a witness box and the Lord is judges before him. And look at how David is declaring his righteousness, not to himself, but to the Lord. Look at what he's saying. For your loving kindness is before my eyes, and I have walked in your truth. This is David in a witness box. I walked in your truth. I have not sat with idolatrous mortals, nor will I go with hypocrites. I have hated the assembly of evildoers. I will not sit with the wicked. So I'll wash my hands in innocence and I'll go about your altar, O oh God. This is David allowing himself to be judged by the Lord continuously as he was living in this world. This is exactly what we need to do, my dear brothers and sisters. We should allow God to examine us. We should be a testimony. We should declare with the same boldness like how David testified. I have no sin in my hands, Lord. I kept away from all the lusts of the world, the lust of the flesh. I kept away from all the evil principalities. Lord, I stand with, before you with a clean hand. Judge me, O Lord. Examine me. And if you do that, you will know that the Lord is not for your destruction, but He is there to redeem you. The judge is not for your destruction. The judge is there to redeem you. That is exactly what in verse 11, David is saying, but as for me, I will walk in my integrity because I know, Lord, you will redeem me and be merciful to me. Amen. This is the role of a judge. This is the role of a judge. Not to destroy us, but to save us. And if we want to be like David... This is the exact prayer that we need to do. Psalm 139. Everybody knows this. Psalm 139, 23 to 24. David is making this prayer. He is completely, completely surrendering himself to be judged in the eyes of the Lord. Search me, O God. Know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties. And see if there is any wicked may, way in me. If there's any wicked way in me, remove that, save me, and lead me in the way everlasting, which is your salvation. So now tell me, what is the role of a judge? The role of a judge is not to condemn you. The role of the judge is only to save you. I do not know about the human judges in this world. They are for a different purpose. But the Lord Jesus Christ, the judge Jesus Christ, who is going to come into this world, is not here to condemn you, but he's here to save you. Amen. So, this is where we should be very careful that we do not reject the commandments of the Lord. 
we do not reject the correction and the edification of the Lord, but rather we allow ourselves to be judged continuously and make sure that when we stand on the day of judgment, we already have been judged. We need not be judged on that day. That is where I'm going to come to for everything that's proof in the Bible. Okay? So we need not be judged on the day of judgment. Isn't that wonderful to hear? Isn't that relaxing to you? Wow. I'm, I'm, I'm relieved now. I don't have to go there and stand with all the rest of the sinners and wait. Oh, Lord, which side are you going to turn? Are you going to show your right hand or your left hand? Huh? <laughs> that will certainly kill us. Won't it? <laughs> that will certainly kill us. You can't stand on the day of judgment. Okay. That is where Jesus himself says, John 12, 48, He who rejects me, who rejects the Lord? The wicked man. The wicked man will reject the Lord. So he who rejects me and does not receive my words. Because the Lord is giving you the words each and every day. Every Sunday he is giving you the words. Every day when you pray or when you read the Bible, the Lord is pointing out to you that you have slipped somewhere or you have fallen somewhere. The Lord is what? Giving you unto the words. And he who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. What is that uh, that judges him? The word. Has that which judges him. And the word will do what? Will say him. But for the wicked people, the word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. So all the advices that the Lord spoken to you, the law, all the advices you li keep listening week after week, didn't I speak with Pastor Deva Putran? My dear children, come away from your sins. Do not walk in the lust of the world. Do not walk in the lust of the flesh. Didn't you hear all these words? The same words which the Lord spoke through His servants, those words will judge you. So we need to be careful of that. So we, need, we must not resist the judgment that the Lord brings us to us when we walk in this world. Because they are here only to save you. They are here only to redeem you, not to judge you. Because the ultimate judgment, every Christian wants to hear is what? What do you want to hear when you meet the Lord, when He comes on the clouds? What is the ultimate judgment you want to hear? Matthew 25, 23. The Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I'll make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Isn't this the judgment that we all want to hear? Isn't this the judgment that we all want to hear? Not your head, at least. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Amen. But what is the judgment that we do not want to hear? What is the judgment that we should not hear? Matthew 7, 23. And I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me. You who practice lawlessness, you who we practice wickedness. We should make sure that we do not receive this judgment. Because what you want to hear from the Lord is not the choice of the Lord, but it is your choice. It is not the choice of the Lord, but what you want to hear is your choice, whether you allow God to judge you in this world, Oh, you're going to give some rosy testimonies about yourself. You're going to self-proclaim yourself into a very good being. But rather, and then go and stand at the judgment throne on that day. Because we cannot. I'm pretty sure we cannot. I mean, because the Lord is not going to force us into that kind of uh, situation. Because I'm pretty sure the righteous is not going to face that kind of a situation. That is what we're going to read through the Word of God. Now, this is where I'm going to raise up a question. If you're going to say that we are going to be judged in this world, and maybe only the wicked are going to be judged on the day of the Lord, then how is this judgment day going to be? How is everybody going to be judged? Now, this is where we come to an interesting part of the sermon. Now, this is like a study. So even if you have doubts on this, I think we're going to have lunch after this. You can talk to me or you can discuss with me. I'm going to be around for a while. <laughs> okay, so you can actually talk to me. Because... I'm going to ask you a few questions, but before that, we're going to read 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 6. 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 6. 
and it says for this reason the gospel was preached to also those who are dead now listen to this carefully to whom was the gospel preached to whom was this gospel preached not to those who are in this world but to those who are already dead maybe you might have a doubt maybe does it talk about spiritually dead but this is where i want to make you understand never in the bible does it call anybody spiritually dead as dead people because you know what is the word given in the bible for that we either sleep or we slumber i'll show you the verses corinthians 15:51 and there you can read behold i tell you a mystery we shall not all sleep meaning we shall not all die why because we are spiritually alive we shall all not be dead but here the word is not given as die we shall not all sleep but we shall all be changed john 11:11 11, jesus said our friend lazarus he's sleeping not dead at one point of time also when he went to raise up jairus's daughter Jesus said that girl is sleeping not dead and 1 Thessalonians 4:14 it says for if we believe Jesus died and rose again even so God will bring with him those who are dead in Christ no it doesn't say that those who are sleeping in Jesus Christ this is where you need to understand the bible never calls those who are dead in Jesus Christ as dead people but rather that they are in slumber or sleeping in Jesus Christ now coming back to 1 peter 4 and 6 for this reason the gospel was preached also to those who are dead what brother how is that even possible those people are all dead and gone that's it once you're dead there is no more a salvation so and then peter continues saying that they might be judged according to men in the flesh but live according to god in the spirit meaning they're going to be judged according to men in the flesh meaning not a spiritual judgment but a judgment where whether they have done good or evil things that is according to the flesh now this is actually a very confusing part because nowhere can we say that a gospel can be preached to the dead that will actually make all the purpose of us living in this world and living holy actually without any purpose at all that means we can live with all the sins in the world and after we die christ will come and preach the gospel unto us and then we can be redeemed isn't that the interpretation for that huh but this actually happened this actually happened how did it happen because in the previous chapter why peter is writing this verse in the fourth chapter is in the previous chapter 1 peter chapter 3 peter gave a precursor to jesus christ preaching this gospel to the dead and where can you find it 1 peter chapter 3 verses 18 to 20 for christ also suffered once for sins the just for the unjust and that he might bring us to god so now listen very carefully being put to death in the flesh meaning he was put to death on the cross in the flesh but made alive by the spirit he didn't go into the grave he was made alive by the spirit by whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison the spirits in prison are people who are already dead because the next verse says these spirits in prison are the ones who formerly were disobedient who were who once the divine long suffering waited in the days of noah because in the days of noah how many people were saved eight people only were saved only eight people were saved but god chose to go and preach the gospel to these spirits in prison to those who were disobedient in the days of noah and preached unto them a gospel 
that they might be saved as well. Now coming back to 1 Peter 4 and 6, for this reason the gospel was preached also to those who were dead. Now does this make some sense somewhere? Make some sense somewhere. Okay, let's find out what it is really. So, remember, when we die, we are not going to be sent into a prison. I'm assuming we are all righteous, isn't it? I'm assuming because you waited for the word of God, you're all righteous people. Okay, when we die, God is not going to send us to Hades or to the depths, or He's not going to keep us locked in a prison. But if you read the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, you'll understand that the moment we die, we are sent into the bosom of Abraham. Do you know what is the bosom of Abraham is? It is basically paradise that was promised to Abraham. It was the blessings that were promised to Abraham. So basically, we are going to sleep where? In paradise. We are going to go there and we are going to sleep there in paradise. So, we are promised to be sleeping in paradise, not dead in paradise. To sleep in paradise if we die righteous. But those who die unrighteous, like the rich man, they will be sent to the pits of the haters. So you have to understand that. So when you come to this verse again, that the gospel was preached also to those who were dead, now you have to answer me. Now you, you all know that the Lord our God is a fair judge, isn't it? There is nothing unfair in Him, isn't it? So when a man commits, this is an interactive thing, you have to answer me, you have to think. When a man commits a sin in this world, and he faces earthly punishment, meaning he gets caught and he's produced in a court and he faces earthly punishments, has he paid for his crimes and will he be revived in the spirit in heaven? See, a murderer or a rapist or a thief, he has received human punishment, maybe 10 years or 15 years or maybe even executed for murder. He has received human punishment. But according to 1 Peter 4, 6, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh. Does that mean since they have already experienced a punishment in this world, would they be actually revived in the spirit when they uh, go to the day of the judgment? Keep it in mind. Now, this is where I want you to understand there is a difference between sin and crime. They are two totally different entities. Sin versus crime. Now, crime can be committed by men and crime can be punished by men. Understand this. Crime, when you actually get caught for a mistake that you committed in this world, and you appear before a, a worldly judge, that judge is going to give you punishment for the crime you have committed, but no way can that judge forgive your sin which you committed. Do you understand the difference? A judge of this world can maybe after a few years of serving in prison, they might give you parole, they might give you a pardon, they even might set you apart. They may forgive you of your crime. They will say you're a free man. You can go out of prison. You can go home. He can forgive your crime. But can this judge, a worldly judge, forgive a sin? No. They cannot forgive a sin. Because there is a difference between crime and sin. This is where you need to understand between punishment and judgment. See, punishment happens to you when you are in this world. Whereas, judgments do not happen here. Judgments and condemnations are pronounced once you leave this world. You can be punished. You can be chastised by the Lord. The Lord will put you through fire so that you will be refined like pure gold. You might walk through the fires. You might walk through tribulation. All for a purpose. Why? 
Because the Lord is punishing you here to make sure your sins are forgiven here. Because only Jesus can forgive sins. An earthly judge cannot forgive sins. He can forgive crimes, but no, he cannot forgive sins. In a similar way, judgments and condemnations cannot be passed by a man. Punishments can be passed by a man. They can punish you with prison sentence or with any other kind of punishment. But judgments and condemnations cannot be passed by a man. Only the Lord Jesus Christ can judge you. No human being can judge you. That's why the Lord says, why are you judging others? The same way you judge others, you will be judged back again. So be careful that you don't judge others. So, punishments are of the flesh, but judgments are spiritual. And not only that, punishments are temporary. You can serve a period of time and you can walk away, fulfill that punishment. But judgments and condemnations are not temporary. They are permanent. Amen. So you have to understand the difference between sin and crime. You also have to understand the difference between judgment and punishment. Amen. So this is where when I want to ask you a few questions. Is God a fair judge? Yes. No question about that. Now, you have to understand how fair this judge is going to be. Will God judge a man who has lived right years throughout his entire life? For 99% of his life, he lived right years, but at the last moment, he stumbled at one thing before he died, and then he perished. Will, will the Lord God condemn him to death? Keep this in mind. I don't want you to answer because I do not know what the Lord going to do as well. Okay? Keep this in mind. This is just for your um, ponderings. That's all. Then will God judge a man to hell who lived a sinner completely throughout his life? He was a sinner, sinner, sinner. But uh, towards the end, he had a disease. And then just two days before he died, he accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as a Savior. And then... Would you be accepted into the kingdom of God? Will God judge him and call him, well done, good and faithful servant? Keep this in mind. Because you have to remember the parable of the wages. I hope you remember it. The one who joined work at the first hour also got the same wages. The one who joined at the 12th hour also got the same wages. The one who will be the last shall be the first. The first shall be the last. So keep that in mind because I cannot decide this. It's up to the Lord to decide what he's going to do with this. But one question I want to ask you, this is going to make you ponder because this is where probably you might get the answer for this. Will God condemn any ignorant souls to the fires of hells or haters? I'm talking about ignorant soul, just born babies. Children who don't have the maturity to understand what is good and wrong. There are many African tribes who haven't even heard about Jesus Christ. There is a tribe near Andaman, the Sentinelese tribe. They haven't heard about Jesus Christ. There are many who are living in North Korea. They don't have a chance to know about Jesus Christ. There are many people who live in many, um, many tough countries where there is no chance for them to be saved. No chance for them to read the Bible. There are many of our forefathers, 100 years back, 200 years back, 1,000 years back, who did not know about Jesus Christ. Maybe even our great-grandfather didn't know who Jesus Christ was. Maybe my great-great-great-grandfather was a Hindu. They didn't know who Jesus Christ was. They were all ignorant souls. Will God condemn these kind of ignorant souls to hell or to haters? So this is where we are going to come to the bottom of all things. Because this is probably a thing which probably is a question in many of your minds, isn't it? How can God condemn a small child? How can God condemn somebody who has not known Jesus Christ at all? Will they be sent to hell as well? But this is where we are going to get to the bottom of all things. To whom was the gospel preached? Okay, because I want to ask you one day, what will happen on the day of judgment? 
there's going to be a judgment. Huh? There is going to be a great white throne. You all know that, right? You all read the book of Revelations. I think it comes in chapter 18. Okay, chapter 11 as well and chapter 18 as well, the judgment comes in. Okay, so great white throne is there and Jesus will be there along with the 24 elders. And then there will be a judgment. But I'm going to ask you, how many times are you going to be judged in this world? How many times are we going to be judged in this world? Once? Twice? Thrice? Many times? No. Because God is not fair if He judges us two times. Because for us, judgment is only once. Isn't it? All men die and they are judged once. Okay, so in that case, when are we going to be judged? This is the most important question. When are we going to be judged? Now many people I know will say, see this is again a meditation. I know after this you'll have lots of doubts, so you can come and freely ask me. Okay, and even if I am wrong, I will uh, say, yeah, maybe it's something which I miss. Now I'm asking you, when are we going to be judged? Many people believe that we are going to be judged on the day of judgment. But this is where I want to tell you that we have all been wrong. Because when are we judged this? The moment the breath exists from our nostrils, the moment we die in our flesh, at that exact point, we will be judged. Because only if you're judged, the Lord will send you either to sleep in paradise or send you to the depths of hell. Because then how is gonna, God, God going to decide? Because the moment we die, we have been judged. If you die right here, if you allow God to continuously judge each and every activity and moment in your life, then we have been continuously judged. We have been made righteous. The moment we die, we are judged. And then we are sent to sleep in the bosom of Abraham. But if we are unrighteous, if we are wicked, the moment we die, we are sent into the depths of Hades. And for that, the verse is, for see, everything there is a proof in the Word of God. I've, I'm not building up my own logic over here, no. There is proof in the Word of God. We're going to see this. Hebrews chapter 9, verses 27 to 28. And look at this. And as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. Men are appointed to die once, and after this, the judgment. Now, this is where many will have doubts. Does it talk about the judgment day? Or does it talk about we being judged right away? But that is why the next verse, here uh, the author of Hebrews is very clearly telling, so Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. Meaning Christ died only once. Only once you were saved. Meaning only once you are going to be judged. Not multiple times. Only once you will be judged. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for Him, He'll appear a second time. Where are we going to wait for Him? In paradise. We're going to wait for Him. He will appear a second time, not for judgment, but apart from sin, for salvation, for saving you. So when you die, and when you're judged, and sent to the bosom of Abraham to sleep and slumber there until the day of the Lord comes. It is not to bring us back to judgment once again, but to bring us to salvation. This is exactly what we read in Isaiah. The Lord is our judge. The Lord is our lawgiver. He is our king. He will save us. So this judge is not coming back to destroy you but He is coming to redeem you, to save you. So, brother, what happens then on the day of judgment? When Jesus is seated on the throne with all the 24 elders, won't the righteous be judged then? 
Now this is where we come to the most important verse. Revelations chapter 11 and verse 18. Now this is after the seventh trumpet. Now God has received all the faithful people away from the world. There is no more faithful people in the world. Only wicked are there in the world. This is after the seventh trumpet. Now the nations were angry and your wrath has come. That is only the wrath of God is going to be poured upon the world. But what happens in the, world, uh, in the heavens is there is a judgment happening. And this is where I want you to note there are three different kinds of judgment for three different kinds of people happening here. Okay? You're going to uh, carefully understand this. Okay, so what is the first kind of people and how are they going to be judged? And the time of the dead, your wrath has come and the time of the dead is written together. What has come for the dead is what we read in uh, Peter. There is going to be a gospel preached unto the dead. Now there is a time come and come for the dead. A time come for the dead that they should be judged. So who are going to be judged? Those who received maybe a gospel. Maybe these are the ignorant people. Maybe these are the ignorant people. I'll come to that later. But the dead are being judged. Not the dead in Christ or the dead, uh, uh, the wicked dead. The dead who are ignorant, they are the ones who are being judged. And the next part of the verse is only where you come to a complete understanding. Because on the day of judgment, for those who are righteous, there is not a judgment there. But what is happening is, read it carefully. The second group of people, those who are righteous, for those people, it is not judgment, but rather the Lord is granting them a reward. The Lord is granting you a reward for righteous people. You're not being judged there. Only those who are dead, ignorant people are judged according to the good or evil that they've done. The righteous people that you should reward your servants, the prophets and the saints, and those who fear your name, small and great. This is the second group of people who are being judged. Sorry, who are not being judged, who are being rewarded. And then there is another third group of people. These are people who are not being judged, who are not being rewarded either. But these are the wicked people, though they knew God, though they heard the word of the Lord, but still they chose to remain wicked. Though they knew Jesus Christ, they did not accept Him. They did not fully surrender to Him, but rather they practiced all the evil in the world. These are the people whom the Lord has termed them as wicked. And these third group of people and should destroy those who destroy the earth. So the third kind of people who are going to be judged are the people who are wicked. For them there is no judgment either. Just like how the righteous people are not judged but rather given rewards by the hand of the Lord. The wicked are also not judged because the moment they die, they have already been judged. They are what they have been done? They have sent for destruction. So three groups of people. One for the dead. One for the righteous and one for the wicked. But if you actually look into this, only those who are dead, probably ignorantly, they are the only ones who are going to be judged. The rest have already been judged when you breathe your last breath in this world. Why am I saying is take a hypothesis situation. You die. The Lord makes you sleep in paradise. And then on the day of the Lord, the Lord sends you to live for a thousand years in paradise. And after making you enjoy paradise and everything, will the Lord on the day of judgment reverse the judgment and say, Oh no, no, I found out something that is wrong with you. The thousand years of paradise given unto you was a mistake. You are actually not uh, termed to be in the kingdom of God. You are supposed to be sent to hell. Will the Lord reverse his judgment? No, because we are going to be judged only once. 
similar with an, a wicked person, a wicked person who has been sent to the depths of Hades, he is not going to be brought on the day of judgment and the Lord say, oh, 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 we made a mistake. You actually were a good person. You were welcome. Come into the kingdom of the Lord. Will the Lord do that? No. That's why I'm saying the day of judgment is not for righteous people like you. It is not for the wicked people like you. But for those who are dead, for whom a gospel was preached according to Peter, for which a precursor was already given, where Jesus went and preached to the disobedient souls who did not listen to the voice of Noah and they perished in the water. Why? Why did Jesus save those people? Because those days there was no law. There was no word of the God, Lord. Even if we were living in those days, we would have thought Noah was a madman. Even we wouldn't have got onto that ark. Would you have got into that ark? I highly doubt it. If I was there, even we would have mocked uh, um, Noah and his family with the rest of them. But since there was no word of God in those days, they were deemed as ignorant souls. That is why a gospel was preached unto them. Because you righteous people are not going to be judged. But Revelation 22, 12 says, when Jesus Christ comes, Behold, I'm coming quickly and I'm going to bring my judgment unto you. Is that what the Lord is saying? No. He's not going to bring His judgment. He has already judged you. That's why the Lord is saying, Behold, I'm coming quickly. I am carrying my reward to give each one according to his work. Meaning, the same thing that was written in Revelation 11, that He will reward all the prophets and the saints of all those people who trusted in His name. The righteous people, you have already been judged. When the Lord comes, He's not going to pronounce any judgment on you. Rather, He's going to carry rewards in His hands for you. Do you understand it? Do you understand? You get a whiff of it. Sometimes it might be a little confusing, but go read these verses back again at home. Read the entire context because I might not have the time to do the entire study today. That's why I'm skipping a few verses as well. That is why you can very clearly see many people might, might be marveled, isn't it? Might be surprised or might be uh, with a lot of confusion. But this is where Jesus is saying, do not marvel. That is exactly what he's saying in John chapter 5, 28 to 29. Do not marvel at this. Because like how we are also perplexed, confused right now. Because when he, even when I was doing the study, even I was confused. But after a point of time, the Lord clar uh, cleared a few things for me. But that is why the Lord is saying, do not marvel at this. For the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves, all who are in the graves will hear my voice. Now, are we going to be righteous people? Are we going to be in the graves? No. Where are we going to be? We are going to be in paradise. So who are these people in the graves? Probably the dead who are ignorant. Probably the dead who are ignorant. I'm saying using the word probably because you're going to go and analyze all these verses. Which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. Look at this. Those who have done, these are the, this is the judgment for those who have died ignorantly. This is the judgment for those who died ignorantly. Because people who died ignorantly had two choices. They could have chosen to do good without even knowing Jesus. They could have chosen to do evil. Now you might ask me, how do they know what is good and what is evil? The day Adam and Eve took a bite of that fruit, they knew what was good, what was bad. Isn't it? So every man after that was born with a conscience of what is good and what is bad. So, this is the judgment for those people in the graves. And what is going to happen is, those who have done good, they will be given, they will be taken to the resurrection of life. And those who have done evil, they will be condemned. They will be sent to the hell. Do you understand this now? 
So for whom is the judgment? Probably only for their ignorant souls. Because we are not going to be judged on them forever. Do not think that there is no judgment for us. There is a judgment for us. But it is not going to happen on the day of judgment. What is happening unto us is, we are being Allah, we have to allow God to continuously judge us each and every day in our life. For us, the judgment is happening right now as we live. Even for the wicked, you for eternal life, them for eternal condemnation. That is where we need to understand that 1 Peter chapter 5, 4 and 6. Can you display that verse again, brother? Yeah. And after this, I'll finish it. I think time's up. <laughs> For this reason, the gospel was preached also to those who are dead, that they may be judged according to men in the flesh. Meaning, they won't be judged according to how much they know Christ. They won't be judged according to the faith which you have received graciously. They will not be judged according to the spiritual inheritance. But rather, they will be judged according to men in the flesh, meaning whether they have done good or whether they have done evil. And But if they had done good, they will live according to God in the Spirit. Amen. And that is where beautifully in one place in Acts chapter, this one verse, I'll read it. And we'll finish it off. Acts chapter 17 and verse 30. Truly, listen to this. Truly, these times of ignorance, meaning for those who lived in ignorance, those who never had a chance to know God, those who never had an iota of who Jesus Christ is, what Christianity is, what faith is, who never knew anything of this. All the African tribes, North Koreans, our forefathers, all these people who are in ignorance, people who are still in this world today. All those people, these are all people who were in ignorance, but all those people who lived in ignorance, God did not judge them, but God overlooked why? Because he wants to preach them a gospel later. Just like how we preached a gospel to those who were, uh, do not listen to the voice of Noah, those who were disobedient in the days of Noah. For them, a gospel is going to be preached. What is that gospel? The consciousness of good and evil, whether they have done good or whether they have done evil. And that's where comes the warning as well. Because days of ignorance, God overlooked. So that doesn't apply to you and me. We all are not in the days of ignorance. We are all in the days of knowledge. We know who Jesus Christ is. We know what the Bible is, what the Bible says. We know everything here. But now, Jesus is not going to term you as ignorant, but rather, so you're not going to be judged according to the good and the bad that you do. But rather, you're going to be judged according to the faith that you exercise. To whether you led a victorious life. Whether you exhibited the love of Christ in this world. So, there is a warning. But now God commands every man to repent. So we don't have the option of being bracketed under ignorance. We are going to be bracketed and under the people who have the knowledge of God, who have understood the mystery of Christ, who have understood the mystery of God. And because we have the mystery of God, God is commanding us, allow me to judge you each and every day. Just like how David allowed himself, search me, O God. Try me, O Lord. Vindicate me, O Lord. If there's anything that is wrong in me, take it away. Bring me into life everlasting. This must be a prayer every day. We have to repent. God is commanding us to repent each and every day. Each and every day, we must allow God to judge us. Man cannot judge you. 
only god can judge you and if you allow god to judge you you need not be scared about the name judge jesus christ comes you need not be scared about the name judge because it is not judgmental because when you allow god to continuously judge you you actually will be saved on the day when you breathe your last you have already been judged you have already been saved you already been sent to sleep in paradise but if you chose to remain wicked then there is a danger then you will still be judged but not into the eternal kingdom you will be judged into the eternal darkness that is why my dear brothers and sisters it's very very important that we allow god to judge us just one verse i'll read and go 1 peter 4:17 to 18 for the time has come because this is a very important verse two minutes i'm done for the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of god what is the house of god the building yeah what is it sam it's us it is time has come for the judgment to begin at the house of god we are the temple of the living god we are the house of god that's why he says it confirms it by saying and it begins with this building with this church no it begins right now with us so we have to allow god to judge us each and every day the time for judgment has come where right now as we live in this world it begins with us first so make sure you're saved and then again comes a warning what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of god if you chose to remain wicked what will be the end of those because there is a very very strict warning giving if the righteous one himself is scarcely saved where will the ungodly and sinner appear amen so today many of us think we are righteous we are standing fast in the lord make sure we are not fooling ourselves like how uh, it is written in the book of uh, hebrews that we do not judge ourselves but allow god to judge us do not give a very uh, wonderful testimony about yourself no god is not interested in that but rather allow god to judge you allow the chastisement of the lord to come upon you maybe if he punishes you it is okay because you finish your punishments you finish your judgments in this world so the moment you die you are not going to be taken up for judgment but rather the lord has got all the wonderful rewards in his hand to grant unto those who are righteous amen have you understood this amen but i want you to ponder over this if you want these notes i can give it over to you okay yeah you can go home you can read it because i want you all to come into the understanding and not be scared of the name judge jesus christ comes not be scared of the day of judgment day of judgment is not for us day of judgment for us is there we are going to be standing there not to be judged but to be handed out rewards so be joyful huh the judge is only there to reassure you he's only there to save you not to harm you or destroy you may god open your eyes today so let us all have a fresh understanding of the day of judgment and let us all allow judgment to start in the house of god allow god to judge you search me try me lord consume me lord make sure that my hands are clean make sure that is nothing unholy in me make sure i don't walk in the paths of the righteousness unrighteousness make sure that i don't tread in the ways of the wicked make that your prayer and i'm pretty sure you don't have to be scared about the day of judgment amen amen pastor over to you